Genesis 1, John 8. Let's read Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Notice it says there that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. That is, before God ordered his creation, it says that it was formless and it was void. That is, there was disorder. There was darkness. There was the untamed deep. Prior to creation being declared good, God had to bring it into order. And how did he do it? He brought forth light. He brought forth light to dispel the darkness. He set the boundaries of the waters and thereby ordered the chaos. Primary to God's ordering work was the creation of what? Light. Light for the dispelling of darkness. It was only once he separated the light from the darkness that he could declare it as good. We start here because... From this account in Genesis, a host of metaphors uh, are introduced into the biblical record. From this creation account arises a myriad of metaphors used for the concepts or, or uses of the concepts of light and darkness from Genesis to Revelation. Darkness from this point forward comes to signify disorder, disorder of every kind. Darkness is said to disorder and to destroy and to disfigure and to deflect glory away from God. That's how darkness is seen throughout the rest of Scripture. While light, on the other hand, is said to order and create and beautify and reflect the perfect nature of God. Throughout Scripture, darkness and light also take on spiritual and moral components. Darkness represents evil. It represents sin. It represents the power of Satan. Whereas light, on the other hand, represents holiness and purity and the perfect nature of God. Fast forward all the way to 1 John, which is almost at the end of Scripture, and we read this. This is the message we have heard from him and and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In many ways, the entire story of Scripture from Genesis on can be seen as presented as a struggle between order and chaos, or between light and darkness. God subdues the chaos and separates light from darkness. But soon after, what happens in Genesis 3? Mankind sins. His fall is seen as plunging creation back into darkness and back into chaos. Chaos and darkness, which now again take on a moral and spiritual sense. As a consequence of Adam's sin, corruption spreads across all of creation. Mankind gives themselves over to sin and wickedness. And so complete was their rebellion that the Bible could say in Genesis 6, verse 5, Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And in verse 11 of Genesis 6 continues, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Mankind had chosen sinful chaos. He had chosen sinful chaos over divine order. And so God prescribed judgment. He would once again allow the darkness and disorder of the chaos waters to prevail over the land. This time through a catastrophic flood, 
It's as if mankind had rejected God's design for life and had no respect for his order of creation, and so God gave them over to chaos. God gave them over to darkness and destruction. You can imagine then during the flood how those thick rain clouds rolled in, blotting out the light from the sun so that darkness would prevail. The waters fall so that the chaos waters prevail once again, uh, really reflecting again the condition of creation before God called it good. Once the flood waters receded in Genesis, God then makes a covenant with Noah. And what's the sign of that covenant? A rainbow in the sky. The promise is this, that as long as uh, human history continues, God would not again pour out judgment because he recognized that the sinfulness of man's heart was innate. If he were to pour out deserving divine judgment, he would have to eradicate the whole human race and human history. But instead, in his mercy, he allows human history to continue, and he puts a sign of his covenant in the sky, a rainbow. What's significant about that? You can't have a rainbow without light. It's a sign that although mankind's sin had plunged creation into darkness, uh, he would always provide some light in the midst of that darkness. Sadly, however, mankind has not responded to God's mercy with obedience. He's not learned from the consequences of his sin. He's not acknowledged God by embracing God's creative order. Instead, what has he done? He's presumed upon God's mercy. He's pursued sinful passions. He's permeated the world with sinful chaos. He's chosen chaos over order. This is the state of our culture today. Chaos over order, darkness over light. So that Paul in the book of Romans could describe man this way. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The heart of man came to embody the darkness. He was driven to disorder what God had ordered, to destroy what God had created, to disfigure what God has made beautiful, and to deflect all glory from God to himself. It was true in Genesis 6, and I think it's true in our day. Mankind, however, has not been alone in these efforts to destroy what God has created and disorder what God has ordered and disfigure what God has designed and deflect all glory from God. The Bible indicates that this love for darkness is shared by some shadowy elements of the spirit world as well. Ephesians 6, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There's a pervasive darkness of sin, rebellion, chaos, and corruption which permeates the world. It's a darkness against, uh, it's a darkness uh, against the light of God's presence and God's design. It's a darkness which much of mankind loves. It's a darkness which Satan empowers. So, where do we see this practically? When men reject God in his design, they're walking in darkness. When they blaspheme God's name, when they live without a fear of God, they are walking in darkness. When they build themselves up in pride, thinking that they have no need for God, they are walking in darkness. When they mistreat one another with oppression and injustice, they are walking in darkness. When they devalue others who are made in the image of God, they are walking in darkness. The person Frank, let's get real practical. The person who spreads gossip and slander against others is walking in darkness. Let's get real practical. The liar. How about this? The lying politician is walking in darkness. The dishonest businessman is walking in darkness. The employee cheating his employer is walking in darkness. The shoplifter is walking in darkness. The person consumed with jealousy at the success of others is walking in darkness. The person constantly arguing online and creating division and discord is walking in darkness. The person who shows no empathy or no mercy towards others is walking in darkness. The person uttering obscenities is walking in darkness. The person harboring bitterness and unforgiveness towards others is walking in darkness. 
The person who creates division, stirs up strife in any form, is walking in darkness. The person who's always losing their temper is walking in darkness. The disobedient child is walking in darkness. The heavy partier is walking in darkness. The drunk, the drug addict, walking in darkness. The person subjecting children to sexual themes and imagery, walking in darkness. The person rejecting God's design for sex and gender and family, walking in darkness. The person using violence to get what they want, walking in darkness. The person willing to kill their unborn baby, walking in darkness. The person oppressing others, using them for their pleasure or benefit, walking in darkness. The racist, walking in darkness. The religious hypocrite, walking in darkness. Anyone who takes pleasure in any of these things by participation or celebration when others do them, walking in darkness. Human societies since the fall have been marked by a pervasive pursuit of sin and godlessness. Worse, a concerted effort to take all that God calls good and to call it bad. To take all that God calls light and to call it darkness. To take all that God calls darkness and to call it light. Isaiah 5.20 warns us, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. A culture in darkness is a culture that celebrates sin, denigrates holiness. It's a culture which hoists the flag, for instance, of perversion while trampling upon God's design for the family. It's a culture which calls truth hate. It's a culture which calls perversion love. It's a culture which calls mutilation affirmation. It's a culture which calls murder health care. It's a culture which calls discrimination justice. It's a culture which calls sexual fetishes personal expression. At every turn, a culture in darkness destroys what God has created, brings disorder to what God has ordered, disfigures what God has made beautiful, denigrates what God values, and again deflects all glory from God to themselves. Where does such an impulse to replace light and darkness come from? Well, we've already seen, alluded to in part, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. It says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The chief power behind the darkness disguises himself as an angel of light. It should be no surprise, then, that we're in a culture that takes all that is light and calls it darkness and takes all that is darkness and presents it as light. They're doing the bidding of Satan himself. Paul describes such a culture this way in Ephesians four eighteen says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And so we learn that mankind in his natural state is in darkness and loves darkness and spreads darkness. Further, he's darkened in his understanding and darkened in his heart. He participates in the works of darkness, celebrates others who do the same. He's alienated from God. He's addicted to sin. And although he is culpable for all of his darkened behavior, we understand he's also influenced by Satan, who is the chief power over this darkness. Now, we must add, as we consider the nature of a culture walking in darkness, that even while it pursues sin and rebellion, it is simultaneously writhing in suffering under that darkness. In their pursuit of sin and the rejection of God, they find themselves left so spiritually blind in their souls and morally corrupt in their reasoning that oftentimes they cannot trace their suffering to its source, which is their sin. They have all sorts of other explanations for their societal ills but their commitment to the darkness will not allow them to see that perhaps they're experiencing the consequences of the rejection of God. Nevertheless, they are aware of their suffering. So, we have to maybe add another caveat, another reminder. We often do at Calvary Baptist Church. Remind ourselves that although we can list those sins, which I just did, 
Although we can list those sins off of a culture in darkness, we should be quick to recognize also that Satan is a deceiver who takes prisoners. Those who walk in darkness, as much as they love that darkness while they are in it, are in fact captives to Satan and in need of deliverance. This is the attitude of God towards sinners. Remember when he makes that promise with Noah, covenant with Noah and all of creation, he promised that he would allow human history to carry on mercifully despite man's sinful rebellion and worthiness of judgment. Why? Because he would work out a plan to redeem mankind and to deliver them out from under the darkness, and he would work that plan out through human history. When the time was right, he would enter the chaos and darkness once more. He would bring order once again. Just as he carried out his mighty creative acts in the beginning, subduing chaos and dispelling darkness, he would do it again. And how would he do it? Well, just as he did in the beginning, he would bring light to the darkness. John chapter 8, verse 12. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light who's come into the world to dispel the darkness. As Matthew says, quoting Isaiah 9, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Jesus came into a world given over to darkness, dominated by darkness, loving darkness, celebrating darkness, but also a world suffering. Under darkness. He came to bring deliverance to a people who, like someone born blind, didn't even know the light that they were missing. When God commissioned the Apostle Paul to preach to the Gentiles, this is how he described his mission in Acts 26 16. He says to Paul, But rise and stand up upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things to which you have seen, uh, in which you have seen me, and to those in which. Uh, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. To do, to do what? Verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So the whole gospel endeavor The Great Commission here is characterized as what? Opening the eyes of the blind so that they will come out of darkness and into the light. Jesus is the light of the world sent to open the eyes of the spiritually blind so that they might turn from sin to him. From the power of Satan to the power of God. He came so that sinners might receive the forgiveness of sins and be counted among the people of God. Jesus is God's light to dispel the spiritual darkness and to bring order to our spiritual chaos. Through him... God's creative work in our hearts becomes a work on par with his other works of creation. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, shine out of darkness, that's Genesis 1, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is that divine creative work busting into the darkness and even to the darkness of our hearts working in individuals so that they can see Jesus is the light. So how does one receive that spiritual light and life? Well, Jesus said to Paul, we just read that in Acts chapter 6. At the end of what he said there, it says that, uh, that individuals may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. How does one receive this light and life? Was well, by faith in Jesus. Jesus says the same thing in our text in John 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. And what does he say? Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Well, that's interesting. Jesus said to Paul that individuals will come out of darkness to the light from the power of Satan to the power of God by faith in him. But then Jesus says in John 8, that individuals will come to the light, they will receive the light of life when they 
follow Him. So is it by faith in Jesus or is it by following Jesus that individuals come out of the darkness to the light? Well, the answer is yes, both. Faith in Jesus and following Jesus are inseparable in the New Testament. John chapter 10, verse 25 is an example. Jesus answers them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Belief and following are used inseparably. The evidence that you don't believe is that you don't follow. The evidence that individuals are my sheep and that they believe is that they follow. And so faith in following, faith in Jesus, is evidenced by following, always evidenced by following. Those who belong to Jesus believe in him. The evidence of that belief is following. So Jesus says in John 8, verse 12, that those who follow him... And we know that that following is evidence of belief. Faith will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Faith in Jesus results in life. Deliverance from spiritual death to spiritual life. Listen, transference from the domain of darkness into the domain of light. And who is that available to this morning? We'll look again at John 8, verse 12. It says, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's two things there. He says, I'm the light of the world. The only suitable Savior, the only Savior for the whole world, first of all. The only Savior for all of mankind. Also, it indicates that all of mankind is welcome to come. He's the only Savior for all of mankind, and, and anyone the world over is welcome to come. doesn't matter who you are. And so this morning, that invitation is extended to everyone here this morning. But also notice in John 8, 12, it says that he is the light of the world, and whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This means that although this is a universal invitation, there must be a personal appropriation. Universal invitation, but... Personal appropriation. That means that a universal invitation does not mean universal salvation, right? It's not universalism. It's the, who, who is it? It's the whoever's who will be saved. Whoever follows him, whoever believes in him will be saved. Jesus will say later in John 12, verse 44, it says, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Whoever believes in Jesus will be delivered from darkness. The spiritual blindness is lifted. The spiritual death is defeated. Eternal life is given. The hard, calloused heart is replaced. The love for sin gives way to a love for God. Pursuing fleshly passions gives way to walking in the spirits. But notice again, Jesus in John 12, 47, we just read it. Like in John 8, 12 says that belief in him is accompanied by following him. John 8, 12, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. John 12, 47, those who believe in him will, what does he say? Keep his words. An ongoing obedience to Jesus. An ongoing following of Jesus. So, Jesus coming as light means that when people believe in him, they are coming to that light and are transformed. Those who believe in him are changed. They no longer follow things associated with darkness. But they do what? They keep his word. They follow. It's for this reason that we find many passages in the New Testament written for the church, encouraging believers, those who have come to Jesus, those who have been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light, to live like it. Examples. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. 
By the way, in a minute, we're going to turn to Ephesians 5, and you can actually turn to Ephesians 5 because it's a little bit lengthier passage. But Colossians 1 verse 9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So Paul encourages the Colossians, check your life. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. There ought to be real, substantial change. You live in a way that's fully pleasing to Him. After all, we are to be following Him. We are to be keeping His words. Fully pleasing to Him. Bear fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And, and what, why? What, what's our motivation here? He says, because He's delivered you from the domain of darkness. This is a life we once lived. Jesus is the light, and we have come to the light, and we've been transferred into the kingdom of light, so now live as children of light. The life of a Christian ought to be different. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, again, you've been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light. So what's now expected of us? Walk in a manner worthy of Jesus. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit, but walk in a manner worthy of Jesus. Ephesians 5. Now, like I said, you can turn there to Ephesians 5. We'll be here for a bit. Paul says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What would that look like to imitate God? What would it look like to live as beloved children? What would it look like to walk in love as Christ loved us? Well, it would look like this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. And then he gives us a four in verse eight. For this reason, because at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Being a follower of Jesus means that we have become children of light. We once belonged to the domain of darkness, but no longer. Our lives have been transformed. First, by an internal change wrought by the Holy Spirit at the moment of regeneration when we placed our faith in Jesus, but then also through the progressive growth, sanctification, in which outward evidence of that growth is seen in our lifestyle. Having come to the light produces fruit. Paul says that the fruit of light is what? All that is good and right and true. All that is good and right and true. This is a complete 180 from where the culture is. As we've already said, a culture in darkness destroys what God creates, brings disorder to what God orders, disfigures what God has made beautiful, denigrates what God values, and deflects all glory from God to the culture itself. When someone comes to Jesus, however, they're transformed. Now they live and believe and love and promote all that is good and right and true. What God calls good, we call good. What God calls right, we call right. What God calls true, we call true. So then it makes sense. That verse 10 of Ephesians 5 here says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The life of the Christian is one lives saying, Lord, show me what's pleasing to you. Show me what it is that you call good. I want to call it good. Show me what you declare right because I want to declare that right. Show me what is true and I will count that as true. Paul continues in Ephesians 5 verse 11. 
take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We don't exactly know where that quote comes from there in Ephesians 5, verse 14. It seems like it's inspired by Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of Yahweh has risen upon you. Probably some early Christian hymn or adaptation or interpretation of Isaiah 60, which is equating Jesus with Yahweh. Here, Jesus presented equal as Yahweh. Through him, it says, we have been brought out of darkness and into spiritual life. And so what's Paul saying in all of this, Colossians and Romans and Ephesians? He's saying, you have been brought out of darkness in the light, so live like it. So live like it. He continues in verse 15 of Ephesians. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't be impure. Don't waste your time. Don't be foolish. Do seek to understand what the will of God is. Don't get drunk. Don't be, uh, do be, do be controlled by the Spirit. Do saturate yourself with spiritual songs and sing them with one another. Do give thanks to God for everything. Do submit to one another. Not always out of reverence for one another, but always out of reverence for Christ because we don't deserve submission horizontally, but we submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus. And why should we do all this? Because we're followers of Jesus, because he is the light, and we have been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light. Because we are children of God. And Paul starts the whole passage off by saying, be imitators of God. 1 John chapter 1 says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. One cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus or have a relationship of God with God while continuing in sin. That's the same as claiming that we're in the light while living in darkness. Light and darkness don't mix. Paul said it explicitly in 2 Corinthians 6.14, what fellowship has light with darkness? If you're here this morning and you're one who claims to be a Christian, but you're walking in darkness, you're a walking contradiction. The follower of Jesus lives for Jesus. The follower of Jesus keeps Jesus' words. The follower of Jesus seeks to imitate Jesus. The follower of Jesus lives in anticipation of Jesus' return. Paul says in Romans 13, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the daytime, not in orgies, drunkenness, sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Don't even open the door. Don't, don't set a place at the table. Don't uh, allow things in your life that pave the way for you to satisfy the desires of the flesh. So faith in Jesus as the light results in a transformed life so that followers no longer walk in darkness, but instead live as those who have received the light of life. Peter said this, 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. The life of a Christian is one who says, my life has been transformed by the mercies of God, so everything that I do is for the purpose of proclaiming His excellencies because He's called me out of darkness and He's brought me into light. The church is a people forged by light. Together we are a race, a priesthood, a nation, a people who collectively proclaim the excellencies of God. We are living, breathing testimonies of the transformative work that takes place when someone believes in Jesus. Our lives are meant to be a stark contrast in the world. As stark a contrast in the midst of this world as light is in the midst of darkness. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So, we asked the question this morning as we approach the end of our sermon, how is your light doing? How is your light doing? I hope you understand the balance this morning if you're a visitor with us. Maybe you don't understand the balance because you haven't been here very often. But at Calvary Baptist Church, we don't do rules as much as we do principles. We're we're not legalists. In fact, we preach hard against legalism. If you've been here for any amount of time, you know that. However, we recognize that the New Testament is replete with lists at times of expectations for those who are believers, not to earn favor with God, not to earn salvation in any sense. But these are the expectations of those who have been transformed by Jesus. And so we put these things before ourselves and remind ourselves and we check our lives with these things because this is wonderful evidence that we have been transformed on the inside. So how's your light doing this morning? Does the way you live your life clearly show that you've been transferred from the domain of darkness? And you may be here this morning, and and you're walking in the light. You love the Word of God. You love your fellow believers. Uh, You're always cognizant of your own sin. You recognize your own failures and so on. That's you. You confess that sin. And that's, I mean, that's the Christian life, right? I mean, you sin, you fail, you confess. By faith, you accept His forgiveness, and you live your life for His glory. And many of you are living that way this morning, and that's wonderful. There are some here, though, likely, who have claimed to be Christians, Who's frankly, their life, frankly, looks like darkness. Messages like this, these reminders are helpful. Why? Because Jesus said that he'd rather us be cold or hot and not lukewarm. Because those who claim to be Christians but who walk in darkness make him sick. And so we as a church do not want to create a culture where we tolerate or celebrate or encourage such hypocrisy. As a child of light, do you love what God loves? As a child of light, do you value what God values? As a child of light, do you pursue what God would have you pursue? As a child of light, do you use your time responsibly for God's glory? As a child of light, do you honor God with your sexual desires and behaviors? As a child of light, are you careful to continually walk in the Spirit by the means of grace? As a child of light, have you given yourselves to the study of the Word of God? As a child of light, do you communicate with your Father through prayer? As a child of light, are you careful not to feed the flesh? to gratify his desires. Every one of those bullet points, I was very, very careful to make sure there was scriptural backing in the New Testament to support. How's your light doing this morning? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He said, whoever follows me, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. If we are his followers, our walk, our lifestyle should display. Now, I hope that you appreciate the balance that we hit this morning. We started out the sermon, and I kind of went after the culture, right? And there's probably a lot of amen, rah, rah, yes, get the culture. That wicked, darkened culture. And then the sermon took a turn. We recognize the darkness of the culture. We also recognize that we have been transformed by the mercy of God. And now we are called to allow judgment to start in the household of God so that we can shine as lights in the midst of that dark. So in conclusion, you may be here this morning, you haven't yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ. Which means what? 
Spiritually, you remain in the domain of darkness. Spiritually, you remain under the dominion of Satan. There's an invitation to you this morning to come out from under that through Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world, and he promises salvation to all who believe in him. You saw his word yourself, right? This is not the doctrine of Calvary Baptist Church. These are the words of Jesus himself. Believe in him, and you will have the light of life. This invitation is to you. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, uh, no matter what your background is, no matter what sins you have committed, that invitation is to you. So the question simply is this, will you believe in Jesus this morning? He's the only Savior from sin. He is the Savior of the world, the only Savior for the world. He's the only rightful Lord. He is the light which God has sent to lead us out of darkness into the light of life. And so now is the time for you to respond. God has brought you here and has graciously given you an understanding of how to be saved this morning. Now is the time to respond. Maybe you're here and you've heard such an invitation over and over and over again, and you resist. And many do resist, and many refuse. But there's a warning. John 3, verse 19, Jesus said, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so nobody generally says, I'm not going to come to Jesus because I love evil. Some say that, but many don't. They have other reasons that they pad for their uh, resistance to the invitation. But at the end of the day, people do not come to the light because they love darkness. And sadly, there are individuals in church who, being children of Satan, disguise themselves as angels of light, walking in darkness, but presenting themselves as children of light. Is that you this morning? Are you resisting coming to Christ? Are you reluctant to become his follower? Is it because you love sin too much? Is it because you love darkness rather than the light? Is it because it, your works are evil? We come with another warning. We'll end with this. John 12, verse 35. Jesus said, The light is among you for a little longer. And he was saying this to his disciples, physically speaking. I'm with you now. But there's a spiritual sense as well that when Christ walked this earth, that was a special time of revelation. This is a greatest revelation that's going to come by God's grace. Here he is. He's the light. Now's your time. Respond while you can. But there's also an application to us. Because God has no obligation to bring the witness of the gospel to your heart continually for the rest of your life. In fact, he may very likely, in response to rebellion, at times give an individual over to their sin so that they become blinded by their own sin, so that they cannot respond. Jesus says, the light is among you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Now's the time, and you may not always have this time. For the rest of you who have believed, you are Christians, Simply say this, walk, walk as sons and daughters of light. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, the light that you sent into darkness. We recognize the human condition. We recognize the state of our own souls prior to salvation. Lord, we were lost. We were alienated from you. We were separated from your goodness. We had no relationship with you. We were in the world, hopelessly lost, finding, attempting to find joy and happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment in the things of the world. While we were blinded by our own sin, while we were yet sinners, you sent Christ, like light and darkness, to lead us out of the domain of darkness. We just thank you for your mercy. Pray that you would help us now, those who claim to believe in Jesus. Uh, 
to live as his followers, to walk as his disciples, to recognize what behaviors, what attitude uh, are remnants of our previous life in the domain of darkness. Revealed to us areas in which even as Christians we've allowed the thinking of the culture to impose itself upon us to affect our priorities, our values, perspectives, philosophies. Help us to see clearly those areas in which we've allowed darkness to creep in. Help us to take these many encouragements and admonitions in the New Testament that encourage us to live a different lifestyle. Help us to recognize these for what they are. Not rules to keep in order to earn your favor, but an understanding of what it is to evident our salvation, what it is to live as those who follow Jesus. And we know that this is not a works-based salvation because all of this is the product of the Holy Spirit. That we fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, we can only fulfill these things as we walk according to the Spirit. So help us to take those things seriously, expose in our hearts areas which we need to change. We pray this morning that you will confront us by your Holy Spirit, confront, confront us for our hypocrisy. We pray this morning for those who are here who are not Christians but are presenting themselves as Christians. They love darkness. They're continuing in darkness. They rationalize. They reason with themselves uh, about it. But frankly, they are living in the domain of darkness and uh, claiming to be Christians. I pray you'd expose them. I pray that you would not allow such lukewarmness. Um, I pray that these individuals would come to genuine repentance, that they would be genuinely saved, uh, and that you would bring forth a genuine transformation in their lives. But don't allow that hypocrisy to continue. Don't allow us as a church to allow uh, these individuals to dilute the standard of holiness in our church. Um, help us to love, help us to encourage, help us to call to repentance, and I pray that these would be genuinely saved. And we pray for those who are just unbelievers, maybe visitors, maybe understanding the gospel for the first time. We pray that they'd come out from the darkness and into the light. We pray that they'd receive Christ as their Savior and Lord. And then lastly, help us as Christians to have the right balance in our attitude towards the culture. Help us to recognize its sinfulness, the vileness of the attempts to bring disorder to what you have ordered, to disfigure what you have made beautiful, to destroy what you have created, to deflect all that's meant to bring you glory, uh, to glorify themselves. Help us to recognize the vileness of all of this, but also to see unbelievers in the culture as those captive to Satan in need of deliverance. So help us to be empathetic, to be merciful, and to remember that you loved us while we were yet sinners. And so we ought to love others while they are yet sinners. Thank you for this, and we thank you for Jesus. I pray you'd help us to walk as children of the light. In his name that we pray.